and humanitarian organizations alongside local business, faith, military, and community leaders from all 50 states who come together around the importance of our civilian tools of national power, development, and diplomacy. We are Democrats, we are Republicans, we are independents, and our network spans from coast to coast throughout the country, from Maine to Arizona, from Texas to Michigan, through right here in Washington and everywhere in between. Our bipartisan National Advisory Council is made up of the nation's smartest national security and foreign policy minds, including most every living former Secretary of State from Kissinger to Kerry. And we are particularly proud of our growing voice among the military community, who understand better than most the critical role that international development and diplomacy plays in our national security toolkit. We are that National Security Advisory Council is co-chaired by Admiral James Tavridis and General Anthony Denny and comprised of over 250 retired generals and flag officers. We also have our Veterans for Smart Power initiative, which is made up of 30,000 veterans across the country who are committed to strengthening our non-military tools. And what brings all of this together, all of these different groups together, is a shared belief in American global leadership. We believe that strategic investments in diplomacy and development are essential to protecting our national security, advancing our economic interests, and projecting the very best of American values. It's why we talk about how a tiny 1% of the federal budget, called the International Affairs Budget, is one of the most cost-effective and powerful investments that our country can make. And it's why we've been asking communities across the country, like yours, foreign aid, what's it worth? Diplomacy, what's it worth? Well, it's funding diplomats and embassies around the world, support for our key allies, including working with our NATO allies to meet the needs of the Ukrainian people and helping them fight back against Russia's unprovoked war. Feeding the world, what's it worth in tackling the emerging global food crisis? and preventing malnutrition in kids in vulnerable communities around the world. And global health, what's it worth? It's our efforts to lead global health investments in pandemic preparedness to stop future diseases from wrecking the global supply chain. So now that you know a little bit about us, we wanna know a little bit more. A short assignment, there's a piece of paper on your table and a pen. Using those cards, I want you to write down your answer to the following question. What's American global leadership worth to Washington? Now, take time to think about that. Throughout our program today, what is American global leadership worth to Washington? And we're going to collect these because we want to know what brought you here today. Maybe you're here because of the economy. Maybe you think it's just the right thing to do. Or maybe you're here because of national security. And if so, I've got a message from some people who agree with you. Take a listen. Nobody in the world wants to see war less than a military guy. We've learned over the past 16 years of war that while military action is necessary, it is not always sufficient. In fact, most of the time it's not sufficient. It takes the development folks, it takes the diplomats, and it takes the military to, to achieve our national security objectives. Those of us who have joined the National Security Advisory Council have done so with a history of service and commitment to this country. We have been in locations where we see the importance of coming together to produce long-term stability. When USAID shows up globally, the Department of State, the Peace Corps, when programs are in place that address those basic needs of food, education, clean water, health, then those things contribute to a more stable society. I think it's important that those of us who have seen firsthand the benefits of diplomacy and development in supporting uh, our military objectives speak out. I am for the State Department. I am for AID. There's a continuing effort to educate not only politicians but diplomats and the U.S. public as well on the advantages of marrying the elements of power of our country. So whether it's a visit to Capitol Hill, whether it's private uh, opportunities with appropriators, whether it's private opportunities with senior players that are in government today, to whom we have access and who will take our calls. When we appear on television, when we go out on the road and, and, and talk to the American people. Traveling to Africa with policy advisors 
so that we could demonstrate the value of the foreign aid budget. We can go out and make the case that this is actually a high return on investment endeavor. We owe those in the State Department, those in AID, certainly those in the military, the resources to achieve the missions that have been assigned to them. One of the visits we made to Capitol Hill, I started off by saying to the senators that we met with, it, it may seem to you an anomaly that a military guy is up here arguing for the foreign aid budget, but we've seen the impact that it makes. It's a privilege to be part of the USGLC, to be associated with like-minded individuals who realize that the military can't go it alone. Now that I am out of uniform, I'm happy to be a part of a team that promotes those things for America and our friends around the globe. It didn't surprise me in the least to see a lot of other retired generals and flags come into this organization. When you're serving that long in government, you've got a sense of vocation, a sense of mission in your life. And, and one of the issues that folks like me have to face is, will that sense of mission continue when we're in the private sector. Now, I've got to tell you, because of efforts like this, where we get to share our experience, I feel that sense of mission as strongly as I did when I was in uniform. That's how important it is. Wow, what a great message from some of our most decorated leaders um, on the importance of, of global development and diplomacy. I'm Alan Belton. I am the president of Pacific Lutheran University in the greatest city on earth. <laughs> PLU is devoted to transformative care and is committed to well-being, to opportunity, and to justice. Global exchange, education, and development have always been a core to our scholarship and to our service at PLU. As a proud member of U.S. Excuse me, as a proud member of USGLC's Washington Advisory Committee, and as someone who believes very strongly in global development and diplomacy as central to demonstrating American values and to advancing our interests around the world, I am very honored to be with all of you here this afternoon. Today, the United States is providing foreign assistance in new and more effective ways than ever, and American organizations are working tirelessly to make the world a better place and a safer place. Strategic investments and assistance programs are critical to tackling global challenges like poverty and hunger and disease. With organizations and universities like Pacific Lutheran University partnering with government agencies and U.S. businesses, incredible things happen. At PLU, we see this truth in action in community-serving partnerships between our School of Nursing and local health care providers, in ongoing partnerships between our School of Business and the Chamber of Commerce, and as well, PLU's longtime and nationally lauded commitment to training students for service in the Peace Corps. It's why we're proud that one of our most distinguishing characteristics and accomplishments at PLU is that right here in Tacoma, Little PLU was the first American university to have students studying away on all seven continents at the same time. It's why at PLU, a global perspective is a part of every student's education regardless of their major. It's why 50% of our students will study abroad while at PLU. And it's why Lutes have historically and continue to be overrepresented in service to the Foreign Service and NGOs across the globe. So whether you joined us today from the business community, from the military community, from the humanitarian community, or from academia, uh, I believe that we all share those commitments and those beliefs. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. I'm Andrea Ray, the President and CEO of the Tacoma Pierce County Chamber and also, like Alan, a proud member of USGLC's Washington Advisory Committee. I'm here this afternoon on behalf of the many large and small businesses here in Tacoma and around Washington State who understand that local economies rise and fall with the economic currents of the world. Most people who buy American goods and services 
actually do not live in America. And many of them live in the developing world where markets are growing the fastest. In fact, 11 of America's 15 trading partners were once recipients of foreign aid. One in five American jobs are directly tied to international trade, and one third of all manufacturing jobs in the U.S. are directly tied to our exports. As advocates of business, chambers, and our policy partners are an essential component of building a smart international strategy to compete on the global stage. It's the international markets that are the most lucrative for us here in Washington, where we are export driven and where we need to compete and win. And that's not possible without the support of critical strategic investments in diplomacy, in economic development, to both guard against corruption and also encourage and open new markets for our goods and services, which we know will help strengthen and build economic opportunity and peace, both here and abroad. As the leader of the Tacoma Pierce County Chamber, I can tell you that the private sector alone cannot keep us competitive in the growing global marketplace. We need wider support and collaboration that we have here with us in the room today to be able to compete and win. And with that, I am now pleased to introduce our panelists for this afternoon, which will feature General John Regney, who served in the U.S. Air Force for nearly four decades. Oh, you're standing up. I can see you because of the lights. <laughs> Uh, as the 17th superintendent of the United States Air Force Academy from 2005 to 2009, himself a graduate of the Air Force Academy, his career has encompassed a wide range of personnel, training, and command assignments around the world. Uh, today we are so honored to have him and also as a member of USGLC's National Security Advisory Council. Also, who will be joining us on the panel today is Carla Costa Sandine, who serves as the Chief of External Affairs at PATH, where she leads communications and marketing, advocacy and public policy, and philanthropic development for the global organization. And then, of course, we will also welcome back our own USGLC's Alex Grant to the stage uh, to moderate the discussion. But it is now my honor to introduce the best congressman in the universe, uh, representing Washington's sixth district. Uh, as a member of the House Appropriations Committee, Representative Kilmer has an important seat at the table when it comes to international affairs budget. Representative Kilmer also serves as the chairman of the House Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress and is the chairman emeritus of the New Democratic Coalition. From his work in Congress to his travels abroad, he knows firsthand the importance of investing in America's development in diplomacy programs to address today's most challenging global threats. Everyone, please join me in welcoming our special guest today, Congressman Derek Kilmer. All right, hello, good afternoon. Uh, it's great to be with you. You here are all very unusual because it's a glorious Pacific Northwest day and you're in a ballroom with me. Um, uh, I wanna just acknowledge and thank um, our mayor. Uh, it's great to see you. There's a bevy of elected officials from around the region who are here and I thank you for your extraordinary service and members of the governor's cabinet. It's great to. Great to see you, thank you for the work you do. Um, I wanna start also by just saying thank you to the US Global Leadership Coalition for hosting this discussion and inviting me to be a part of it and perhaps most importantly for the important work that they do. So Andrea mentioned I proudly represent the sixth congressional district which is about uh, after redistricting um, nearly 80% of Tacoma, the Kitsap Peninsula, the um, incredible Olympic Peninsula where I was born and raised. And today we're here to talk about a topic that is really important, and that is American leadership. 
and in particular, the importance of that leadership on the global stage when it comes to tackling perhaps the biggest challenge that uh, we have faced in our time, not just here in Washington, not just here in the United States, but across the globe, and that is the, cl the climate crisis. Uh, so why am I here? Well, one, I'm here in part because I admire the work of USGLC, um, but I'm here also because I represent a district that is already seeing the impact of climate change. You know, Governor Inslee said we are the first generation to see the impacts of climate change and the last generation that can do something about it. You know, as we're sitting here in this glorious space, I represent four coastal tribes that are in the process of trying to move to higher ground as a result of rising sea levels and more severe storms. Um, I, I've lived, other than going away for college and graduate school, I've lived in this region my entire life. I never remember checking the weather forecast and seeing the forecast be for smoke. And you know, we know that we have seen more severe wildfires and challenges facing the uh, health and uh, safety of our, of our forests in this region. Um, about 3,000 people in the district I represent make their livelihoods tied to growing uh, shellfish and harvesting shellfish. We have a robust fishery and uh, they are seeing their livelihoods impacted by changing ocean chemistry uh, and a decline in some of the marine life that depends on healthy oceans and that is impacted by the climate crisis. I'm also here and germane to today's discussion because the climate crisis has a, a direct impact on our national security. I serve on the uh, House Appropriations Committee and on the Defense Subcommittee and you know I've largely messed up as a member of that committee because um, you know, a lot of my colleagues travel to really fun places and I mostly go to areas where um, we have conflict or uh, where I visit military installations. And I just hear a consistent message about the impact that climate change has to our security. The Department of Defense, which is the largest employer in this county and the largest employer in the district I represent, has identified climate change as what they call a threat multiplier that makes our world less safe. Um, in just the past few weeks alone, we've seen a deadly heat wave scorch across uh, Western Europe. We've seen record rains drench, drench East Asia. We've seen severe drought in the Horn of Africa. We've seen wildfires rage in Northern California. And to top it off, researchers in Finland announced last week that the rapid warming of the Arctic, a, a definitive sign of climate change, is occurring even faster than previously described, showing that over the past four decades, the region has been heating up four times faster than the global average, and in some parts of the region is up to seven times faster. I literally just came out of a meeting with, the, with our region's leadership of the United States Coast Guard and discussed some of the security concerns and some of the investments required part and parcel of the warming of the Arctic. So that's scary stuff. So why does it matter? Well, it matters uh, because a changing climate and related extreme weather events are leading to cascading risks around the world, triggering chains of events that can lead to political and economic turmoil, including mass migration and food insecurity and conflict. In fact, we know that climate is already a major driver of migration and displacement, with 30 million people internally displaced in 2020 alone and growing each year. In addition, we know that climate change can damage and change agricultural infrastructure, which in turn can fuel additional civil unrest. These factors threaten the security of every country on the planet. So what are we doing about it? Well, I'm pleased that after a few years absence in terms of, of global leadership on the climate crisis, President Biden has brought America back to the table to lead the global fight to combat the climate crisis rejoining the Paris Climate Agreement, taking a host of executive actions that would establish combating climate change as a national security priority. In fact, in the first days of his presidency, President Biden signed an executive order establishing climate considerations as an essential element of US foreign policy and national security. And in that same executive order, among numerous other steps aimed at prioritizing climate in US foreign policy and national security, the order directs the Dep Director of National Intelligence to prepare a national intelligence estimate on the security implications of climate change and for all agencies to develop strategies for integrating climate considerations into their international work. And listen, the Department of Defense, as you heard um, uh, uh, in that video, recognizes the importance of foreign assistance and recognizes the threat posed by the climate. Since Austin has stated that to keep the nation secure, the DOD must tackle the impacts of climate change. 
Underlining that commitment, the department recently released their climate risk analysis, which concluded that the climate crisis will lead to a host of issues for international security, including increased global instability caused by rising sea levels, drought, wildfire, and other disasters. So simply put, the impacts of climate change are far-reaching and are interconnected. Um, we know increased drought will likely lead to crop failures and impact global food supplies, having a direct impact on, on the military's ability to operate around the globe. The DOD is also worried about climate change's growing impact on its 5,000 installations worldwide. We see this even locally. Um, I know there are some folks here from Kitsap County. When I sit down with the folks from the Navy in Kitsap County and say, what's keeping you up at night? One of the things that they are concerned about is access to the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard. There's kind of one road in, and um, it is uh, very vulnerable from a climate resilience standpoint. With rising sea levels, the prospect of that road at Gorst washing away and limiting access to the only West Coast port that can maintain a carrier is a real concern for the United States Navy. I keep staring at the Secretary of Transportation as I say that. <laughs> you know, more than 1,700 of our bases are in coastal areas with some already affected by sea level rise and extreme weather events. For example, Hurricanes Michael and Florence caused a combined $8.3 billion in damage to bases in North Carolina and Florida. And winter storms in 2021 caused damage to installations in Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, and Louisiana. These hurricanes, winter storms, and extreme weather events will only get worse, racking up billions of dollars in unplanned costs. Uh, in addition, climate change will impact our international alliances and relationships. Uh, let's look at the Pacific, for example. And I'm on the home stretch here. Uh, <laughs> realizing China's challenge to global stability, the DOD has designated the Indo-Pacific as their priority theater in their most recent national defense strategy. The bases and installations in our region play a real role in supporting the DOD's shift to the Pacific. You all know this. And the danger upon as allies and partners face an existential threat from climate change and sea level rise. And we know our competitors, including China, are looking at taking advantage of regional instability caused by climate change. So I've outlined a lot of the big problems. The question again is what are we going to do about it? Well, there is progress in our nation's capital. I mentioned some of the work that the administration has done. I am proud that just yesterday the president signed the Inflation Reduction Act, which is the single largest federal investment in combating the climate crisis. This bill invests hundreds of billions of dollars in the effort to curb greenhouse gas emissions, improve, improve climate resilience, and grow our green economy. Importantly, the bill incentivizes the transition of consumer technologies that, to reduce emissions and lower energy costs. It supports clean energy production and manufacturing and invests in decarbonizing our economy. And it focuses investments in disadvantaged communities and rural communities to ensure that communities that are too often left behind will share in the benefits of a transition to a clean energy economy. This is a cost-reducing law. This is a job-creating law. And it's a law about U.S. leadership in combating the climate crisis. The investments in this bill put the U.S. on a path to reduce emissions by roughly 40 percent by 2030. That, to quote our former president, uh, President Obama, is a big deal. I left out part of that. Um, uh, we also saw the passage of a bipartisan infrastructure law, which helps tackle the climate crisis by making investments in our energy transition, in our electrical grid, in electric vehicle infrastructure. That's a big deal. So let me close with this. I believe we, got, we have got to continue to make smart investments in combating the climate crisis and in foreign assistance. And the work of the USGLC matters. We know that strategic approaches to foreign assistance can serve our national and economic security interests. They can address humanitarian concerns. They can prevent people from dying as a result of preventable diseases. And we are the world's largest economy and greatest democracy, and I believe we have a valuable role to play. And as a member of the House Appropriations Committee, that is a focus for me. I appreciate the USGLC's partnership in that regard, and I appreciate all of you for being here and caring about this. So with that, um, I look forward to your questions.
good. Well, I think you, uh, I think you covered everything. So All right. Uh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs> Enjoy your dessert. <laughs> Well, uh, I want to thank you all for being here with us today. Really excited for this conversation. Um, I want to kick things off on national security. Uh, that is a, a big topic here today. Because we talk about climate change, we talk about national security. And it's more apparent than ever that today threats no, no borders. That means what's happening overseas matters to us here at home. Whether it's record heat waves in the Pacific Northwest, wildfires along the West Coast, uh, historically severe droughts in the Horn of Africa, or flooding throughout Europe. These global crises are interconnected and all threaten American national security. And Congressman, you've talked about this, military leaders, diplomats alike, have all sounded the alarm about the national security challenges presented by climate change. Uh, the U.S. Army climate strategy released this past February notes that there is an increased risk of armed conflict where climate effects compound social instability, reduce access to necess necessities, and undermines fragile governments and economies. Can you speak more about why the threats climate change pose to America's national security and the unique role that development diplomacy plays in addressing those threats? Yeah, I may answer this briefly because I, I spoke to some of this already. Yeah. I mean, you can, you can go region by region Right? I mean, I just mentioned meeting with the Coast Guard around the Arctic and some of the national security threats that, that climate change poses there as you see, in essence, a great power competition sort of migrate north. Uh, the challenges facing some of our allies and island nations in the Pacific are creating, again, p the potential for conflict and, in, in essence, a great power competition as you see China begin to flex. That is directly related to, to the climate crisis. You see uh, uh, in Africa, as we see more and more drought and food insecurity, you see competition actually with regard to foreign assistance as China leans in quite heavily to develop greater alliances through foreign assistance and the United States through entities like USAID play a really important role in that regard. And so I, I guess I would just point out that part of the way that we show America's strength is not just through its military. You know, obviously we have, there are dangers in this nation and it is important that we have a strong military to address those issues that may lead to military conflict. But not every problem can be solved by a bomb and a tank. There are other f tools in our foreign policy toolbox and foreign assistance is one of the most important. Trade is important, diplomacy is important and ensuring that the United States is using the right tools in our toolbox to meet the right circumstances, I think is vitally important. Absolutely, and uh, we talked about the military and it's not just the, the national security element, it's military readiness is another big component here when we talk about uh, climate and the role it plays because General, as you know, the Department of Defense released a climate action plan uh, showing that dozens of military bases are at risk from climate change. Today, the Department of Defense manages more than 1,700 global military installations on coastlines that are vulnerable to rises in the sea level. How does climate change affect America's military readiness? What are the national security consequences of not adequately investing in leading global climate initiatives, General? Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. And uh, Congressman, you need to get on the Armed Services Committee as well. You, you really got, you're <laughs> connecting all these dots very, very well. But. Um, to respond to that, let me, let me talk about briefly about four dimensions, I think, that are all part of this. And the first has already been covered, uh, our installations here in the continental United States. Uh, at home, we have coastal flooding, we have floods, we have droughts, we have fires, we have storm surges and things that are all very, very challenging, uh, not only to the people, but we have to displace our fighting forces to safe ground and other things every time there's a, a weather warning that's coming. Um, in 1916, the Army Air Corps opened up Langley Field, uh, which is Langley Air Force Base, home of the first fighter wing, in the Tidewater of Virginia. We have records from 1930 that show, and by the way, when you, when you land your jet at Langley and you get off, it says, welcome to Langley Field, 11 feet above sea level. That's at base ops. The base itself is three feet above sea level in the Tidewater area. 
And our records show that from 1930 till today, we've already had 14 inches of sea rise already. And what that translates to is every time there's a tropical storm and a hurricane that's going by the North Carolina Outer Banks and headed toward Virginia, Langley floods. And people are losing cars and their personal effects in addition to the military impacts on their readiness. The congressman mentioned some recent hurricanes, you know, Tyndall Air Force Base in the Panhandle of Florida was one of those bases that took a direct hit and it just completely flattened Tyndall after we moved all of our aircraft and people out. And uh, there were decisions made to rebuild Tyndall because of the ranges in the Gulf of Mexico and the Florida senators were gonna go catatonic if we moved that workforce out of Florida. <laughs> so us taxpayers fitted the bill for $5 billion to bring Tyndall back and it's under construction now. And when it's finished, there'll be a lot of resiliency things in it to protect it but I'll guarantee you that it's gonna get another direct hit from a hurricane. When, we don't know, but it's coming and the frequency, as you know, has been increasing over time. The second dimension has to do with training, and particularly in the states, because in the National Guard, um, by law, they're there first and foremost to augment the combat forces of the active duty. But as you know, the Adjutant General has the Army Guard and the Air Guard under him or her, and they report to the governor. And in my state where I live now in Arizona, they wear two hats. There's a TAG and the Director of Emergency Management for the state of Arizona. And the governor, when there are floods and when there are stresses at the border or fires or whatnot, he goes, resources, there we go, and taps the guard. So we have to train the National Guard in addition to combat is to get ready for the next unexpected uh, natural disaster that the governor and the state are gonna need help on. The third dimension is overseas in our combatant commands. And uh, I, I, had the, I was fortunate to be in the Pacific Command. And yeah, we have all of our war plans to defend, you know, in case we do have to go to war. But I will tell you that more time was spent working as members of the country teams with the ambassadors, with USAID, with the intelligence communities, with all the relief agencies. And what we were doing was a lot of humanitarian rescue operations. Uh, when typhoons and when Bangladesh would flood again, which is every year, you know, the Marines and the Navy and the Air Force would come in and we would work that hard. And we were doing that more and more frequently, consuming more of our expertise and energy. And the last the Congressman touched on is global warming has, has brought back to us the Arctic. It is a new geostrategic impact of global climate change. You know, in the 50s, my father in the Air Force helped put in the dew line, uh, the ballistic missile early warning defense from stuff coming over the North Pole to transverse Canada and the United States. We're back to that because Russia has 11 time zones in the Arctic. And as you mentioned, it's, it's, uh, the ice is retreating faster than expected. Russia has over 40 icebreakers. The Coast Guard, when this all came to light, had two. We have some now in appropriations to, to get some heavy icebreakers to the Coast Guard and we need to accelerate those, but we're behind. And, and Russia and other nations will try to exploit that region and come into the region, whether it be for natural resources or access or ports, and it's coming. And it's another, from a defense standpoint, we need to be ready for forces that closer to the continental United States and to North America with our NORAD treaties that we have and so forth. So, and the implications of that, I'll just offer, and you've already touched on it, I'll just offer one thing. You mentioned the Pacific Islanders. The irony here with climate change is those really small Pacific Island nations, the Marshall Islands, the Kitabitis, the Maldives, who have contributed this much you know, global warming are the first ones who are getting hit as their atolls are disappearing and their main islands are gonna be eventually overtaken by this, which then is migration and all those other things. So, a long answer, I'm sorry, but that's, that's how I view it. It's fine, it's fine. A lot of great information there, and you know, we talked about uh, 
the excess of water, but in other parts of the world, we're dealing with the absence of water. Uh, in PATH, I know Carla does a lot of work uh, in fragile communities and, and the Horn of Africa, which is now in its worst drought in four decades, has driven 40 million people into severe hunger. Uh, in Ethiopia, PATH has worked directly with local partners uh, to strengthen children's health care, to promote digital tools to monitor health threats, boosting its resilience to global shocks like climate change. And by 2030, it's expected that 2 billion people will live in a conflict and fragile state, making them more. Figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> How did you work at PATH keep us safer here at home? Yeah, well, thank you. So first of all, thank you all for being here, um, and thank you for including me on the panel for the Congress in general. Um, I think that just just asking me to be here and incorporating the conversation about about human health and how it is directly impacted by the changing by our changing planetary health, um, I think speaks volumes to USGLC, and it's really important that that conversation continues to be to be closer. Um, and so at PATH, we are a global public health organization, just really, really briefly. We're based in Seattle. We were headquartered there, founded 45 years ago in Seattle. Um, and we're now in over 70 countries around the world. We have about 1,700 people working to strengthen public health, mostly in places where um, markets or communities have been left behind. Um, and so as we think about planetary health, we think about climate change, it's a crisis for, for human health. And um, I guess to, to start there and maybe just frame it up, there's the kind of obvious ways that we're all pretty familiar, familiar with. Uh, the heat waves hit, and we know the direct impacts that rising heat have, has on our bodies, on human, on human health. Um, and you mentioned things like nutrition, what happens when there's droughts, so there's kind of these big obvious ways that we're aware of what happens for
must do a prevention side as well. So I think the bill signed yesterday is an incredible step towards actually breaking down um, emissions. Uh, but just to mention uh, a little bit on the on the innovation side and the sort of uh, treatment side, what what we do is we look at things like okay, where are there going to be nutrition problems? Where are people going to lack access to healthy food? And we scale up things like fortified rice um, that, that hundreds of millions of children in India have access to, to now. That is that's that's rice grains, but it's fortified with nutrients that otherwise are no longer accessible because of uh, issues like climate change. So those are a couple. Just a few things. <laughs> 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 no, thank you so much. I want to move on to another issue, which is the economy. 95% of the world consumers live outside the U.S. borders. The fastest growing economy in the uh, yes. low and middle income countries. But climate change is threatening to the global economy. For industry that are vital to the global community of borders are potentially being threatened by this. So, Congressman, you know, a recent report found that. The damages of climate have already cost America's economy more than 100 Middle West ports, a total of nearly $4 billion per year. Climate resilience can help protect these industries by improving infrastructure and limiting its vulnerability from the devastating impacts of climate change. And the World Bank recently reported that every dollar invested in climate resilience in low and middle income countries brings a $4 return on investments in the global so as these economic impacts of climate change are a ripple throughout the world, can you share why American global investments in climate resilience is a good return on investment? For sure. So let's talk about economic risk and let's talk about economic value. From an economic risk standpoint, you see this in our region. You know, my friend Commissioner Johnson, Commissioner Brotherton, and Commissioner Dean are here from the Olympic Peninsula, where we have a thriving forest products industry that is negatively <laughs> impacted by these severe conditions uh, you know, that has seen substantial wildfires that have impacted uh, the industry across our state. Um, I mentioned the impact of our fisheries and to our shellfish growers. It is an existential threat to their industry. Um, the ag industry is impacted by this. The, the White House recently released a report, wrote a report that said Climate change could reduce American GDP between three and ten percent uh, by the end of this century. Um, it, it used to be unusual for Congress to have to pass what's known as a disaster supplement. It is now an annual occurrence, where in response to a hurricane or uh, some sort of coastal disaster or uh, issues related to flooding or wildfires or name it, Congress has to pass what is usually tens of millions of dollars to address that problem. So that's on the risk side. Let's talk about the opportunity side. If we step up and make these investments, one, there's all of that savings to some of those impacts, right? If we can actually get out ahead of it, we're spending less money on fighting wildfires, we're spending less money on addressing flooding, we're spending less money on crop insurance. Uh, uh, but we're also, you know, the nations with whom we compete have recognized that they can grow jobs and grow industries, including some industries we haven't even thought of yet, uh, in addressing this challenge. And, you know, not to quote a former Seattle Seahawk, but why not us, right? You know, <laughs> why not us? You know, the Secretary of Energy was in Swing Washington last week at the Department of Energy's only marine science lab. And while we were there, we were talking about some of the economic opportunity presented by this cutting edge research. Some stuff that was like mind blowing, right? That, you know, uh, uh, research around the use of algae to use ocean water to pull out uh, essential, uh, essential earth elements. You know, it, I was literally like, this is like science fiction, right? Um, the scientists came up with his shoes were made out of algae. You know, it was like, it's amazing. Right? Um, so I, I share that. I did not get a pair of shoes, but um, I share that though just to, 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 to give the sense that all of that research, which by the way will be advanced by the law that was passed yesterday, presents incredible economic upside, not just in Silicon Valley and not just for, you know, 
large utilities. It provides opportunities in Swim, Washington. It provides opportunities here in Tacoma. Like yesterday I was at um, the Maritime Blue uh, Incubator event, you know, where we are going to see innovative entrepreneurs here in Tacoma growing jobs that are focused on our environment and combating the climate crisis. So why not us? from day one 45 years ago to bring the public sector and the private sector together to improve public health. Um, we got our start in, in that exactly with some researchers in Seattle realizing that there were gaps in the market in countries around the world who simply did not have access to the innovative products that we Americans had access to. Um, and so today, as you said, we partner with some of the biggest companies in the world, many of whom are headquartered right here in Washington State, um, and we're quite literally often brokering and helping support uh, building relationships between country governments and some of these, these companies. So you see like Amazon and Abbott, uh, I see on the slide here, those are some of our partners, bringing diagnostics, for example, to entire countries and communities who need diagnostics. Um, and so, so, but we think about it, I think twofold, it's high ROI in terms of wealth for American businesses, building workforce, building their workforces, um, but also in terms of health, because what's happening obviously is it's getting these companies with, that are American, uh, in, um, billions of people rather. And, and so then what happens downstream of that, I think just to make a point, I know you're asking about the, the, the impact on American businesses and to come back to it, but obviously what that means then is when communities are healthier, when people are healthy, they can go to work and they can go to school and entire communities and countries, then those markets get are, are stronger. Um, Andrea mentioned earlier the statistic that we love, that those are entire countries where those markets have improved. And a huge part of that is always human health and people being able to go out into the world and have opportunity. Um, and so, so, those, com those countries then, those people, those communities become customers of not only pharmaceuticals and digital products that are improving health systems, but of well, TVs and you know, other consumer products um, and, and things that strengthen American businesses. But it's also the right thing to do, just have to, public health, have to put that on all the time. It's the right thing to do to ensure that something that we have access to, that I have access to, to keep myself healthy or safe, to keep my son healthy or safe, that everyone around the world has the same ability, and I think that's a core American value. Absolutely, and great segue into our next round uh, on humanitarian values. <laughs> so let me turn to our next topic, uh, investing in development diplomacy. It's not just a smart thing to do. Carla said it is the right thing to do. Uh, it's who, it reflects who we are as a country. It's so important that we have that element. And as we've spoken about, Climate change is, uh, is unfortunately a driver of humanitarian disasters because record heat waves have engulfed the Pacific Northwest with triple digit highs. Historically, severe droughts have fueled dangerous wildfires along the West Coast. And it is welcoming to see that there is a growing consensus in Congress that climate related disasters are leading to new humanitarian challenges. And they're dis disproportionately affecting the developing world. So I have a question for the audience here. Uh, if we don't address climate change 30 years from now, how many people will need humanitarian aid because of climate-related disasters? Is it 50 million, 100, over 100 million, or over 200 million? So raise your hand if you think it's 50 million, over 100 million, over 200 million. All right, we have a, a smart crowd here today. <laughs> Uh, and, and Congressman, it's, it's not just the crisis, the climate is not just a crisis affecting other countries. It impacts our communities here in the Pacific Northwest. And in Congress, you've led on climate issues uh, in the Puget Sound region as a member of the House Appropriation Committee uh, and as a founder of the Puget Sound Recovery Caucus. You've said that that is our nation's most iconic body of water, a place on which generations have built their lives. What are the consequences of not taking action to address these threats? 
And why are these investments not just the right thing to do, but the smart thing to do? Yeah. Let me say a few things on this front. You know, part of the work that we're doing related to Puget Sound is just recognition that not only is it an iconic body of water, it's really important to our economy, and it's really important to the commitments that have been made to Native American tribes. I still remember it was the very last meeting I had with Billy Frank Jr. before he passed away. And he said, you know, before the Bolt decision, we got about 2% of the fish. After Bolt, we got about 50% of the fish. And it was more fish at 2% than it is now at 50%, which was a pretty stunning thing to hear. The, uh, you know, I have sat at the Quileute Tribal School. They, they just opened a new one. But before that, I mean, any one of us in this room could throw a rock and land it in the Pacific Ocean. And every time there's a storm surge, they flood. You know, I stood uh, in Tohola, the lower village of the Quinault Indian Nation, uh, with their former uh, president. And she said, you know, when I was a kid, the ocean was a football field's length away. And she said, now it's our front porch. You know, you can go online. You can literally go to Google and type in Quinault Indian Nation and flooding, and you can find pictures of people literally rowing a canoe through the village because it has just filled up like a bowl because the village is below sea level. And so if you look at some of the challenges we face, you know, it's about not just a economic threat, it's not just about meeting uh, trust obligations, it's also about the ability of people to live with dignity. You know, in the appropriations process, uh, you know, I think three of the 10 community projects that we got this last year were focused on helping tribal communities move to higher ground. Um, this year, several of our priorities are focused on helping com communities move to higher ground because they are just dealing with it. Um, you know, uh, Congresswoman Strickland and I uh, are tag team partners on the Puget Sound Recovery Caucus because we recognize and, and thankfully uh, got out of the house the Puget SOS Act. And many people in this room have had their oar in the water trying to help promote that effort and, and elevate the issue of Puget Sound protection at the federal level. So we're gonna continue this work because I think it is vital, not just to our region's interests, not just to our economic interests, um, but you know, as a dad, I wanna make sure that future generations are able to enjoy these extraordinary natural resources that we've been able to enjoy as well. Yeah, you know, we're, we're talking, you know, of course, how to prevent crises in the future and one of the uh, things that General Townsend said uh, recently, uh, General, is that, he, he, well, excuse me, General Townsend, who heads Africon, General, as you may know, uh, he had called dip diplomacy and development America's tools of first resort. By partnering with strategic allies, investing in our development agencies, we express our humanitarian values, we broker diplomatic agreements, and we prevent crises in a way that the military cannot do a strong defense, keep our nation safe, and project our democratic values around the world. Um, Mr. University President, you, you'll be you'll be nice to know, happy to hear that sometimes students actually remember stuff that they had back <laughs> in class. When I was 18 years old in my second year at the academy, my first poli sci class, they introduced us to before they they put an acronym together on the instruments of national power, uh, which were diplomacy, also a political dimension back then that's kind of lost some of the dying influence the importance of the economics and the trade and so forth, the information that back then now has exponentially increased, and of course the military. And our, and our captain instructor was saying, know these and over your career, you'll, you'll see how they all come together like this and complement each other and how people will want to use the military one first. And we don't ever want that to happen. So pretty good, pretty wise counsel then from that, that captain. But and an example of how we work this is in the Cold War and after the Cold War, uh, the strategic policy of the United States overseas was one of constructive engagement, where you have uh, in the regions of the world, and again, I was in the Pacific Command, where we had 42 bilateral relationships with countries, and then we had alliances as well. but. The military there was obviously ready to go should we have to go to war. For example, the Op Plan 5027 for the defense of the Korean Peninsula. We exercised, we trained, we made sure all the logistics were going to be there and so forth. That was a given. 
What we spent more of our time on, though, was every country uh, working with the ambassador, working with the country team, that was a broad spectrum of, of those instruments of national power, including chambers of commerce of U.S. companies in those countries. Uh, we developed a target for every country on what they needed. And most of the stuff that the military was involved with, aside from working with the, their armies that tended to run their countries, was civic actions. Like, we need infrastructure. We need roads for this village to connect to that village. They need uh, access to water that's reliable and water that they can use and consume. They need an agricultural kickstart. And so working with USAID, working with the ambassador country team on developing the country so that they, their standard of living could improve and their trade and economics with the United States would, would improve all toward having peace. And at the same time, they saw the United States values and we would try to steer them in the democratic direction uh, in those positive values. So we always wanted to use uh, those tools first. And I guess you can sum it up with uh, our position overseas and our unified commands are, number one, we're ready to go militarily if we need to. Please don't use us first. Take it full advantage of all of these long-term investments. And by the way, the Chinese take time. It takes a long time to start the investments, to work with the countries, to build the trust and relationships. And we walk away with U.S. access and influence. The flip side of that is in the absence of that, those vacuums will be filled as they have been filled by China with their Belt and Road Initiatives and other things like that. So the U.S. needs to be out in front leading all of this and making sure we we use the levers of the instruments of national power effectively and work with the Congress and the appropriations committees to make sure that all of those agencies, including the intelligence communities, have their resources ready to go so we can all collectively work to that end. Absolutely. So we want to make sure we have time to get to the audience for some questions. So I've got one more for Carla while we're talking. Would love for you to, to think about your questions. We'll have some mics going around. Uh, but, but Carla, we've talked a lot about American values, and, um, and, and you mentioned this as well. How does the work that PATH does embody America's values, and where have you seen success in helping communities adapt to and prepare for climate shock? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I mentioned, you know, I mentioned earlier, um, but, but just to, to add on, I think for, from our perspective, as we think about improving public health around the world and extending the access that we have in the United States that maybe isn't always <laughs> taken in full advantage of here, um, but the access that we have to the tools we need to be healthy and safe. Um, there's a spirit of generosity and I think a responsibility uh, given the wealth that we have and given the, um, yeah, the power that we have in the world to extend in that spirit of generosity. Um, and it's, 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 it's also the right thing to do and and it certainly does help us. I know we talked about national security earlier. We've all learned um, diseases know no borders. Um, and so a health threat anywhere can become a health threat here, can become a global health threat. Um, and so our focus is, of course, is on, as I mentioned, very vulnerable communities, communities that have been left behind by sort of traditional markets. Um, but it's, it's, um, it, it has a global impact and it comes back to, to strengthening our own economy, strengthening our own sort of standing, I think, in, in, in the world. So uh, if you have a question, raise your hand. Got one right back there already. Uh, you stand up, tell us, uh, tell us who you are. There's a microphone there. there. Hi there, first, thank you so much for spending your incredibly valuable time with us here today. And thank you for your leadership in this important conversation. I'm with World Vision, thanks for your work at PATH. Mm -hmm. And at World Vision, organizationally, we are talking about hunger and the global hunger crisis. We're actually meeting with Representative Kilmer's office as constituents in September. See you then. And um, locally, it's wonderful that we can celebrate incredible partnerships that like Washington State University has with USAID and the Feed the Future program, which helps combat food insecurity and that's great, but again, at World Vision, we're talking a lot about the three C's. COVID, 
climate and crisis. And we all know that the war in Ukraine is taking the levels of hunger to global records. And we're living right now in a, a global hunger crisis. And so this question is for the general. Uh -oh. Could you help us <laughs> directly make the links between food security and our national security and why America's leadership is so important right now? Okay. You have two incredible halos around you. So <laughs> the, uh, thank you for your question. And, and we might need some help on this one. The, uh, I like your three C's, by the way. The, uh, first, I'd like to just mention human nature. Because on your first C of COVID, the thing that struck me the most, here we are in the United States of America, the most developed, advanced country on this planet, maybe in the universe as far as we know. And, uh, and what happened when you think about that from our friends and neighbors? They went to the grocery stores and started raiding all the shelves for themselves. And uh, they're hoarding stuff. And they didn't really care about the other person. It was, I got to get all this stuff so I can protect my family. And I'm scratching my head going, if that happens here in our country, what is it going to happen to a country that's a third world developing country when their entire livestock system is gone? Their agricultural base is non-existent. And what you end up with is stressing the internal mechanisms of that country. It's going to lead to crisis, like it has led to civil wars in several countries in Africa that they're still going on. So the, the implications of that are where the, the country itself might not be able to deal with it and you have political chaos and overthrows and other crises that we have to get involved with militarily. That's when the military tool gets called in toward the front end and we don't really like, like to do that. Um, there's a lot of health implications associated with this as well. And Carla is best to talk, talk about all of that. But, and then the last piece of this has to do with, with leadership. And I think that's what the whole, all this is about, is making really turn into all of this. Because we're watching right now animal species migrate because of climate change. And that's gonna have a ripple effect eventually down to us. And let's get ready for that and make sure we can avoid all of that. So I didn't solve world peace for you, but that's, that was my take. Carly, you might want to talk health on that. I don't know if you want to do that or not. Yeah, yeah I'm, happy. I'm happy to jump in for just a second and also to say um, we have a, a team in, in Ukraine, and it's a, it's a perfect example of everything we're talking about right now. So a team who for years and years has been working to build a stronger health infrastructure in a country um, is now in crisis mode and we're watching basic HIV care and cancer care just fall by the wayside and they're in crisis mode right now. Um, and um, the data is kind of coming out regularly and it's, it's, it's pretty shameful. Um, but right, so I, I think, I, I, just, I would agree, I think it's the root causes. We, we just see the impact when by the time it reaches that point that there's a hunger crisis um, and that, that um, food scarcity gets to that level that it causes additional conflict. Um, we're just responding then, right? And I'm not, it isn't band-aid solutions, but, but um, and we can do them and we can make sure that we're trying to continue to uh, ensure that people have medicines and have food, but the root issues are where, um, out of bargain, no, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> but, I, but I think that is where, where the focus has to be. We could fall a hand up over here. Or two of them, why don't we take both uh, at the same time, then we'll, we'll go one, two. First of all, um, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Um, and I want to just thank Carla for her comments um, from PATH and the focus on the humanitarian impacts of all of this. Um, Congressman Kilmer, thank you for your strong leadership since the beginning of your service as our representative. And your, for careful and generous investment in global poverty reduction um, I'm with a group called Results, and we work with our members of Congress to advocate for the end of poverty, both at the global level and at the um, national level. Um, most recently, uh, Congressman, you signed on to the Global Malnutrition Prevention and Treatment Act, 
and advocated for the full funding for the Global Fund to prevent AIDS, TB, and malaria. That's an example of the leadership that you, you provide. You also serve on the House TB Elimination Caucus. Thank you. Um, on behalf of the hundreds of results volunteers in Washington State, I urge you to, su stop, to support the Stop TB Now Act of 2021. It's real consistent with your participation in the TB caucus, so um, we're uh, counting on you to do that and to support the READ Act to sharpen our national commitment to improving the lives of children and families in under-resourced countries. We also want to endorse our sister organization focused on global warming, which um, uses the same citizen advocacy methods that we do. That organization is called Citizen Climate Lobby. So thank you, and we encourage you to take a look at those two bills and hope that you will. Thank you so much. Um, Senator Lisa Wellman from the state of Washington and thank you all for your service. Um, we have had a global um, pandemic, we haven't had a pandemic, that we have responded to very quickly because for the past 40 years, people have been developing a way to make vaccines faster, 40 years. How many years ago was it that Al Gore talked to us about climate change and we have gone through a period of time where there were deniers and there were it's not a thing and et cetera. We are a very divided country right now. Because of Ukraine, we're sitting with a situation where many of the European countries have decommitted to their commitments on the climate uh, Paris Accord because they need energy. And so while I hear things that we're adjusting to in health and in food and whatever today, I'm not seeing people who are saying we are about to face a war that is 1.5 and two degrees higher uh, in temperature. We are looking at probably the best weather we'll see for the rest of our lives. What are we doing to mitigate? I mean, I know we're, well, not mitigate. We are trying to keep that 1.5, hoping that somehow it, it will work and we will not get to where we think we're going. But what happens when the you know what hits the fan? What are we doing to think about that future, to act on that future? We won't have enough military to go around to every nation in the world to put out the fires, to put out the revolts, to put out the crises. We won't have the resources. No nation will have the resources to do that on a worldwide basis. So what are we doing to think about what that future is going to look like and to address the challenges that my grandchild is going to face? Thank you. Comment on global health and uh, a comment here, a question here on climate preparedness. Uh, Congress will go to you first and other commissioners have their views. Yeah, first of all, let me say that uh, the priorities that you just laid out are really part and parcel of those goals. I'll, I'll check out the two bills that you mentioned, but um, certainly the, the broad priorities are very consistent with what, what I work on on the Appropriations Committee and what we've worked on in partnership with Results and others. I also appreciate you mentioning that Citizens Climate Lobby, which you know is a group of Democrats, Republicans, independents who are pushing for national action and, and global action in combating the climate crisis. And I think does a really good job of engaging members of, of, uh, of Congress and, uh, and elected leaders uh, writ large. In fact, uh, one of their leaders from our region was my guest at the State of the Union a couple years ago because I thought their, that group's voice is so Im important. Um, Senator, um, thank you, and uh, I saw Senator Kroc here and other legislators who, uh, for your leadership at the state level, um, I think you know, one of the things that I uh, applaud is the fact that our state hasn't waited for the federal government um, to take action on some of these issues. That's a good thing. I, you know, in my first term in the House, I was on the Science Committee, and I remember we had a hearing on the myth of climate change in the Science Committee. That's really something, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I think, I, I wish I could tell you that, you know, there was a unanimity in, a sh in shifting to recognize the threat that the climate crisis presents. There is not. 
I think, you know, because of many of you here in this room and others around our country, you know, you're starting to see at least some uh, shift in perspective and thankful you're starting to see some action on this. I mentioned, you know, I think the most important, some of the most important thing that we, things that we can do uh, are actions to mitigate the degree to which the poop hits the fan, as you put it, um, or I think kind of put it. Uh, you know, and that's why the law that passed yesterday, uh, that was signed yesterday is so important. That's why the infrastructure bill uh, is so important. And we're not done. You know, this is, uh, these are important steps, but there are going to need to be more step, steps uh, forward. On top of that, some of the conversations that we've had around resilience and international assistance are going to be really important. You know, I mentioned that most of my travel has been to visit military stuff. You know, and some, yeah, I went and visited the Navy because we were doing a partnership with the Navy in India. And part of what the military wanted us to see was water projects to address drought in India. You know, because that is a security concern, right? Sorry, I, I see Representative Levitt. There is a giant bright light. So thank you for your leadership take to mitigate the badness. But the most important thing that we can do uh, is actions to limit how bad things get. Okay, so uh, I want to make sure that we stay on time here. So I have one last question to close this out, uh, and it's for all three of you. Uh, so a bit of a rapid fire response. We'll start with Carla, make our way down. But we asked earlier, what's it worth? Can't wait to see what everyone was writing down earlier. But for you three that are on the stage with me here, what is it worth, in your words, to invest in our diplomatic and development tools at home? Carla, let's start with you, and then we'll make our way down. Sure. Uh, so again, um, it's 1% of the budget, um, and I think it's really important to keep that number in perspective. Um, and that 1% has incredibly high, from a public health perspective, has incredibly high ROI on wealth for Ameri the American economy, but on, the, on health for billions of people around the world. Um, and maybe just to, to bring it home to Washington State even uh, a little bit more. Again, we're home to we're home to some of the world's biggest companies. So, so when those companies thrive, it not only is impacting our economy here in Washington State, but they also rely on employees who live in a lot of the places that we are talking about around the world that are hardest hit, um, that often had nothing to do or very little to do with uh, adding to the increasing uh, issue, climate issues. Um, and so I think I'll leave it there. It's that high ROI um, for health and wealth. Well, I think, obviously, it's very worthy, and uh, it really is the long-term investment for our future well-being and for our way of life, is so we can avoid all these crises and things, and to really set the stage for individuals' growth and countries' growth, economic growth, and, and from a military perspective, areas that don't have conflict, so peace. Our table didn't have note cards, but yeah. when the question was asked, I looked at this as an open book test because it literally says the three main things that I would have written that I would have written on our note cards. Right? It's about keeping us safe, saving lives, and strengthening our economy. Absolutely. Well, thank you all for being with us. A uh, big round of applause for our panel here today. Great job, Carl. Thank you, Congressman. Invite my uh, my colleague Luke to come up to the stage to close us out. Hello, everybody. It's so wonderful to be back with you here in person, to be back in Tacoma. So thank you all for taking time out of your busy day to, to come and join us today. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Luke Wenz. I'm USGLC's uh, Deputy National Outreach Director, and I oversee our operations here in Washington. So please find me after the event if we haven't met, because we should. Uh, I, you know, honestly, this is the best part about my job, is being able to be here in Tacoma with all of you to talk about why America's investments in development and diplomacy are crucial, not just for our country, but for us here in Washington as well. I'd like to start by uh, thanking our, our extraordinary speakers, General Regney for coming up and being with us once again for your leadership and friendship. Carla, thank you, of course, as well. Uh, to Mayor Woodards, who uh, just had to step out for a minute, as well as to Andrea and President Belton. You guys have both, uh, both your organizations have been longtime friends to USGLC here in the state, so thank you for that. And of course, Congressman 
thank you for your leadership, to your friendship, to, uh, to USDLC, for your extraordinary work to protect America's development and diplomacy programs. I'd like to, again, say thank you on behalf of all of us, and please join me one more time in a round of applause. Thank you all. Well, I, for those that don't know, I'm also a former congressional staffer. And one thing I can tell you, members of Congress do not get thanked enough for their good work. So please do reach out to Congressman Kilmer and other members of the Washington delegation when they are being strong leaders on development and diplomacy programs while they are talking about why this matters. Either reach out and say thank you to his office or call into your local radio station or re reach out to your newspaper. Most importantly, just talk about it with your family and your friends and your communities because really this stuff does matter and it's your voice that matters most to Congress Congressman Kilmer. Um, on that note, please do uh, watch out for an email you'll be receiving from me here pretty soon with some photos from this event and additional information. And, and sign up to receive information and updates from USGLC as we'll keep you apprised as to what's happening in Washington, D.C. in regards to this issue. So you, went when, so you know when to reach out to Congressman Kilmer. And also, I just want to again thank you all for being here, for your leadership, your passion, your friendship to this organization, your work here in Tacoma, and for your voice that makes all of what we do possible. It's because of leaders like you that America remains the greatest force for good in the world. So thank you all for being here, Congressman. Thank you.